I'm Joe Ambrose, the executive director of our Center for Family-Owned Business. And the center is the embodiment of Mike Deerberg's idea to provide services to family businesses that go beyond the traditional banking services. Uh, we provide resources to family businesses uh, through our website. And on that website, you'll find webinars, and we have some great speakers on our webinars. Two of them, you've, one of them you heard from, one you will hear from in a bit. Um, we also have a family business survey. The first one was last year in 2023, thanks to Jenny Denon, Katie Rucker, and the great team over at McKinsey. Um, in your packet, you've got a QR code. You can't miss this one. Um, this takes you directly to the website for the survey. So please, uh, this, this weekend or when you get back to home, please take the survey. It takes about 10 minutes. There's about 27, 28 questions. One of those questions, or some of the questions, uh, relate to how you value your family's business. What are you managing it for? For what, for, for what purpose? And that ties in nicely to the presentation you heard yesterday and the presentation you'll hear this morning from Josh Barron. Speaking of Josh, second year in a row he's been with us for a symposium. Um, we might have to rename this symposium the Josh Barron event. But uh, Josh is co-founder and senior advisor for Banyan Global Advisors, and he has an international client base. He is also senior lecturer at Harvard Business School co-author of many books and articles, and one of the books is the Harvard Business Review Family Business Handbook, which um, is, gives the most practical advice that we have found to family businesses in how to handle everything that comes up in your business. And we are uh, very happy to have Josh here today, uh, fit this in between all of his kids' events, which I appreciate. So without further ado, Josh Barron. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all this morning, and um, I'm a, a real big believer in what you all are doing here with the center. It's such an incredible uh, opportunity to learn from each other, to network, to build the kind of connections that can help you go through all the, uh, all the ups and downs that come with being part of a, of a family business. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. This topic is one of my favorite ones um, because I think it really is in many ways getting at the heart of why we're all here, which is thinking about what, is, what does success mean? What do we want to get out of being part of a family business? Um, before I jump in, in your packets, you will find hopefully a worksheet that looks like this. Um, you may want to get it out along the way. I will pose some questions that I would like you to be reflecting on um, over the course of the conversation. Um, and then after I'm done talking, the, the really fun part begins. You'll have a chance to talk to each other at your tables um, about those questions, and then we'll have a chance to, to have a group uh, report out and discussion on those topics. So um, as, uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, my colleague Rob and I wrote this book uh, on how to build and position a family business to last for the long term. And um, you know, one of the, our, our overall approach in sort of thinking about how do you do that, how is it that you can position a family business to last for the long term, um, was this notion that at the very heart, what makes a family business distinct and different from any other kind of business um, is the fact that you have owners um, who are actually really connected to the business. And if you think about you know, a public company by comparison, if you think about owning shares of Apple, right? what does it mean to be an owner uh, of Apple? Not very much, right? You can go to the annual meeting, you can vote the proxy statement. I've never done either of those things for any of the companies that, that I own stock in, um, of which they're, you know, through mutual funds, I might own thousands. But when we think about a family business, you know, you're not an investor, you're invested, right? And when you have a relatively small group of relatives, even if there are a couple hundred of them, um, you're able to provide a level of influence um, over the business that is truly extraordinary. Um, and that's really the core notion that with ownership comes the ability to make choices that shape the long-term success or failure of the business. Okay? And one of the choices is the one that we're gonna spend time talking about today, which is this notion of value. That as the owner of a business, you actually get to decide 
what you value, right? If it was a, if a widely held public company and we were trying to say what does success mean, uh, I think we'd all have the same answer. It's how do you maximize returns to shareholders, make the stock price go up, right? It's a much more complicated question when we're talking about a family business. And that's what we want to spend some time talking about today and hopefully giving you some tools uh, that you can bring back and have a conversation um, with your family about how you think about and define success. Um, any of you read uh, Bo Burlingham's book, Small Giants? Yeah. It's a, it's a really, really neat book, and he, it's called Companies That Choose to Be Great Instead of Big. And, um, and Bo has this really neat quote in it uh, where he talks about how almost every business bestseller um, you know, is all about public companies or companies that aspire to be large and public. Um, and all the companies we focus on uh, you know, are, are like that, whether it's on you know, television, the radio. There's only a few companies that dominate the press. Um, I can, I've taught at two business schools now. We focus primarily on what it means to be a public company. Um, but what he talks about is he said the greatest confusion is about the notion of shareholder value, um, which ignores an obvious truth. What's in the interest of shareholders depends on who the shareholders are. Right? And this is a, what comes with owning a business is the ability to really think more uh, carefully and discriminately about what is it that success looks like. And that's where kind of we coined this idea of owner strategy, right? We think about the strategy for our business. What markets do we want to enter? What customers do we want to serve? But this is looking at the higher level and saying, as owners, what does success mean for our business, okay? And owner strategy is all about establishing what you value as a family ownership group. And you can think about that as what, you know, what game are we playing? You know, why are we playing? You know, what's the reason that we're doing this? The reason we're spending the time and energy uh, to sort of go after this together? Um, how do you keep score? How do you know if you're doing well or not so well? And then what are the rules? How do you know what's inbounds and out of bounds? And we'll talk about sort of three different layers of questions to get at each of those dimensions. As an owner though, your job is not to then go tell the executives how to run the business. That's actually what you hire them to do. Um, so it's not about sort of giving really concrete direction. Um, it instead is about empowering the leaders of your business. And when you do this well, it actually gives them the ability uh, to drive the business forward in ways that align with what your purpose is as the family owners that accomplish your goals and then sit within what we'll call your guardrails of the business. Why, why spend time on this? Um, you know, why is it important to sort of actually go through and define your owner strategy? Well, there are some bad things that happen when you don't. Uh, when the owners of the business aren't aligned on what success means, the business can start to, to stagnate. People aren't sure exactly what to do. The leaders become tentative. Should I, should I make this big investment? I don't know if people are gonna actually want to do it or if they're just gonna then say, well, we don't want that. Um, and the time gets wasted. Um, people you know, don't want to work, work for a business that doesn't have a clear sense of direction. Um, as owners, you can actually, especially as the business gets larger and maybe as it's run by non-family members, you can start to lose a sense of control over where the business is going. Um, and then when there isn't alignment, then you can have these you know, family disagreements that spill over from disagreements about business and who gets which you know, dividends and how much we're reinvesting in the business. Those can spill over into family relationships. On the other hand, though, um, when you do this work well, it really does put your board, if you have one, and your management team in a position to be successful. And actually, one of, one of the hallmarks that I've seen in my work of a good board of directors is they will ask the question, what do the owners want, right? They'll say, we can help you achieve almost any objective you can think of, but you have to tell us what's important. Right? And when you do that, you empower your leadership team to be able to go out and bring their very best talents and energies uh, to make that happen. Um, it also allows you to, to choose your own adventure, to sort of get, get out there and accomplish what you, you'd like to do. And of course, I, I teach strategy in addition to family business topics, and the, the old saying goes, you have a strategy even if you don't articulate it. You still you're still making choices, right? So you have something implicitly um, even if you haven't made it explicit. So what we're gonna talk about is really the elements of what does it mean when we say owner strategy? What does that mean? How do you do that? And I want you to think about this as sort of cascading down, starting at the very highest level of we'll talk about purpose, means the, the why question, why are you in business together? 
And then we'll go one layer down and say, okay, well, how do we think about the goals? How do we think about trade-offs? What do we want more of? What are we willing to live with less of? And then the most specific is getting into this notion of guardrails, that as the owner is giving some specific ideas about what you want and what you don't want, okay? By the way, if you have questions along the way, please, please feel free to ask them, okay? Anyone so far? It's the wrong direction along the street, though. It's the wrong direction on the street. It could be on the right side. Well, how do you know where it is? <laughs> you get to choose your own direction, right? There you go. All right, so purpose. We, we had, some, I thought, some really good conversations yesterday about uh, you know, purpose and values and, and the why question. Um, it's a really important thing to, to, to talk about. Um, and for those of you that were on the, uh, the, the conflict webinar that, that I did a few months ago, we talked a little bit about how purpose is actually a really valuable thing in a family business. And it's one of the ways that you can try to keep conflict in your family business sort of at that right level in that Goldilocks zone. Um, and that's because when we have a strong purpose, um, it helps us to focus on the collective goals and a little bit less on our individual goals. Um, and you can see this quote here, this is from a book called High Altitude Leadership, and the authors talked about what it, you know, leadership through the lens of, of expeditions, like climbing Mount Everest and climbing uh, K2 and so on, and they say, you know, most expeditions actually fail on the way down. And not on the way up. On the way up, everyone is working together. Um, everyone uh, understands that unless we all put our best efforts, we're actually not going to reach the summit. And so I'm not so worried about whether you're doing a little bit less of the work or taking a little bit more of the food. I know that only by bringing our best efforts together can we accomplish this thing. And they say once you reach the summit, that's when the knives come out, right? That's when we've, we've accomplished this goal. Now I start to wonder, well, why aren't you doing your part, right? Because we've lost the sense of overall perspective. And there's actually a lot of data that talks about the value of having a compelling and strong purpose for, the, for your business results, okay? Now this is something that can actually be a challenge in a family business. And the reason is that unless we work at it in a family business, purpose will naturally decline over time. Right? And we think about a first generation of founder. Found, how many founders of businesses in the room? Right. My experience, when I go and ask a founder, you know, why did you start the business? They'll kind of look at you funny and say, well, you know, I, I had to. Right? I had to do something to take care of my family, um, you know, put food on the table, or I had this idea, and I really tried my best to put it down, but I just couldn't. I had to stick with it. Right, so in most places, in most examples that I've seen, founders are just swimming with purpose. There's a sense, a sense of, you know, it's driven by survival, driven by creative energy, uh, and it's no longer a business, it's an identity. It's part of who you are. And this is part of why it's so hard for founders to let go of businesses, because it's not a job, it's literally, this is who I am, and how do I let go of who I am, right? And that's why founder transitions are, all, are partly so challenging. Okay, so we get to the second generation. It's usually not quite as intense, but usually there's a lot of, a level of connection because the founder is, that's your parent, you look up to them, you admire them. Um, the business probably grew up around you. Uh, one of the second generation leaders I know, he talks about how the business was born around the same time he was born. It kind of went, you know, it grew up as he was growing up, reaching maturity as he did. Um, it feels like a member of the family, sometimes the favorite child in the family, but it feels like a member of the family. Um, but there's this very strong sense of connection. Maybe not quite as strong, but it's still, it's still pretty strong. And if we're not careful though, by the time we get to the third and the fourth generation, you ask people, you know, why do you own this business together? They'll say, well, I have a sense of responsibility, or it's an obligation, or I don't want to screw it up, um, or maybe it's a great financial investment. And those are fine reasons to own a business, but they don't have the same pull on you know, the heart and, and the motivation um, as some of these other kinds of experiences do. So what we're trying to do as a, in a family business, in part, is to make sure that we retain that sense of why, that sense of, of motivation. Why should we do this? And I always tell people, you don't have to. You don't have to have a family business together. You should think about it as something that you're doing it because you want to, because you see value, right? And purpose, the, the goal of going through this exercise of defining your purpose um, is to try to answer that question in a way that feels compelling to you. 
Okay? And when you think about purpose, people use lots of different words. I wouldn't get too hung up on them. Um, oftentimes, we'll talk about our values. You know, who are we? Um, uh, our mission. You know, why do we exist? What's the value that the business creates for our family? What's the value we bring to, to the business? Or it's a broad-based vision. There's some big thing we want to accomplish together. Um, it may be you know, one of these things. It may be all of these things. Um, but I think that's really getting at this notion of you know, what, what is purpose. And as you're asking yourself, the, the, you know, what kind of, you know, why are we in business together? What I found is it sort of breaks down into these three categories, and we'll, we'll talk about them um, in more detail in a little bit. Um, but you ask people, why do you grow? Why do you want to be in business together? It may be because you want to growth. You know, we want to grow the company. And some people do that because they're, they're motivated to build wealth. Others believe that their business has a really big impact on society. And the bigger the business gets, the more impact you can have. Um, the more employees you can help, uh, the more that you can help customers and, and, and communities and so on. Um, others sort of think about the business as a way to generate, we think, think of as liquidity. By liquidity, I mean that means taking money out of the business. Um, some people think of it as a way to sort of have a nice lifestyle or maybe to fund your philanthropic efforts. You know, the, the, the more profitable the business is, the more that we can take money and give that away to, to, way, to, give that away to charity. Um, or you might say, well, it's actually, you know, we're, we're more thinking about control. There's a certain way that we want to run the business. And if someone else uh, bought the business or took it over, they would change these really, um, you know, different practices or ways that we you know, run the business in a way that's very different from others, right? And so you can sort of start to think about, you know, what are your, what are your motivations uh, for, as a family for, for owning the business together? And so that's what I want you to, you know, when you get into your groups, just to sort of preview it, what I want you to think about and talk about in your, in your groups, and these questions are on the sheet of paper, um, do you have a clear and compelling statement of purpose? And again, it could be a mission statement or values or vision or something else, but do you have something that really answers this question of, of why? Um, and of course, it's nice to have it written down, but, but how do you bring it to life? Um, how do you sort of talk about it? How do you engage your, each other? How do you engage the next generation in conversations about why you're in business together? And are there things after talking to other folks here are there things that you can learn from and do to try to better activate that sense of purpose in your family business? Okay, so far? All right. We're going to get now into this question about goals. So we've started at the most abstract. And, and one of those things about purpose is that it's not about making choices. It doesn't have to be one thing. It could be a number of different things, right? And one of the things that I've noticed in family businesses is that um, you know, different people are motivated by different aspects of it. I work with one family um, that's in um, the wire and cable business, and there's some family members that are really fascinated by the business themselves. They're like engineers, they really enjoy the, the nature of the business. Um, others are, you know, really motivated by, you know, the fact that the, the company has, a, uh, you know, a thousand employees and the, the lives of those employees are affected positively by being able to work there. Um, others are really thinking about environmental sustainability and to say, you know, they're, this, they're contributing to the electrification of America, which is part of, of becoming, moving towards a more sustainable energy future and so on. Um, and they're really motivated by that. And if you look at their purpose statement, it actually covers all of these things. You know, it doesn't have to be that each of them resonates the same with you. What you're looking at is to come up with a statement or a, a view of it that where everyone can kind of hang their hat on something, right? It doesn't have to be that everything is equally appealing uh, to each member of the family. But as we're talking about strategy, now we're going to get down into the level of actually thinking about trade-offs, that you can't have everything you want, and that one of your roles as an ownership group is to answer the question, what do we want more of and what are we willing to have less of? Okay, and that's where we're going to talk about this idea of what I call the owner strategy triangle. And the basic idea here is that a business, most businesses, every business that I've come across, um, faces some trade-offs, right? You can't maximize all of these things at the same time. Uh, the growth of the business, you know, how fast it can grow, how much money you take out, again, that's liquidity, right? How much money you're removing from the business and how much control you have over decisions. And think about control as something that you have until you give it to someone else, right? So think about the equity of the company. If you give up some equity to someone else, all of a sudden you don't make all the decisions. And also, by the way, if you borrow money, 
uh, the banks will impose some restrictions as well, right? And some of that's healthy, but uh, you know, if you question the control you give up, ask someone that's ever violated a bank covenant. It's not a very pleasant experience, right? So you can't sort of maximize all these things at the same time. You have to make some choices. Um, if you want more growth, for example, the way that you do that is that you invest either your own money into the business, right? So you have less liquidity, um, or you take other people's money and bring that into the business to grow and you give up some level of control. Now, there are a few companies out there that focus only on one goal. For example, if you think about sort of an internet startup, it's all about growth, right? The whole thesis is we need to get to scale as big as possible. Um, it, you know, we're gonna bring in lots and lots of outside capital. We're gonna borrow money. Uh, we're not gonna worry so much about profitability. We're not gonna pay people very much. And the, the idea is at the end that we're gonna go public and everyone's gonna become rich. Right, so it's all about, uh, all about having growth. So some companies, not, not sort of the, they're the ones we talk about, but there's actually not that many of those out in the, in the economy. So some are very growth focused. Um, some are like very, very liquidity focused. It's hard to find one that is perfectly this way, but I, um, there's this really wonderful book called The War of the Wall Street Journal, which is about the Bancroft family and their ownership of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and they kind of acted like this way for a while. They, you know, the company was very successful, it was very, very profitable. They started to have a very nice lifestyle um, off of the dividends. Um, as the company was continuing to go through, and this was a time when the newspaper business was very profitable, as it started to go through disruption, they still lived a nice lifestyle. And they were essentially borrowing money to be able to, to fund it. Um, and then Murdoch came along and offered them a tough choice, and they ended up selling, selling the business out. Um, it's also season two of Succession, if, you, if you've watched that. Um, so some companies are very focusing on you know, the liquidity aspect, and then some are very much all about control, and especially some founder businesses actually get stuck because the person sort of needs to be at the center of every single decision, and it's actually hard for the business to grow beyond their purview, right? So that happens, but most businesses actually, it's kind of like a pick two problem, right? That you pick two of these to focus on, um, and you ha decide that you want to do less of the third one. And so think about these as kind of like zones within the, within the triangle, right? So one zone, and a very common zone in family businesses, is this idea of growth and control, that you essentially grow through retained earnings. You make $100, you maybe pay yourself a dollar or two to keep the lights on, you put the rest of it back into the business, you do that kind of over and over again, and over time that's how the business becomes very successful, right? So you're focusing on growth, um, you're focusing on keeping control, um, and you do that by retaining the earnings, bringing almost everything back into the business. Um, the second would be to, over here, growth and liquidity, which is to grow through other people's money, right? So you, you take the company public, or you take on an, an outside investor, or you lever up the business, um, and you're able, therefore, at the same time to grow the company, uh, to take some money out, but you're giving up some control along the way. And the third one is this notion of liquidity and control, that growth isn't actually the, the focus of the business, you're focusing more on keeping it going uh, and then taking some money out of it. So I work, uh, one of the families that, that I advise um, is, is uh, they, the founders of a very successful jewelry business. Um, and it, it started as, out as an art project, not as a business. It happened to be that they were, they were making this art, they were going to shows, people were loving it, uh, and they were able to turn it into, um, into, into a business. Um, but for them, it always retained this notion of an art project. And if you ask them what matters to you, um, they'd say there are only two things we care about. One, we want to make the jewelry that we want to make. We don't want to be told that because gold is more popular than silver, you should be making more gold jewelry even though our foundation is in, is in silver. So we don't want any outside investors, right? And we don't even want any debt because that means that we're gonna have to ultimately answer to someone. So the other thing is, is that we want the company to produce a nice dividend every year. Uh, we use that money, we, you know, we live a nice lifestyle, we feel like we've earned it, but we live a nice lifestyle, um, and we give a lot of money to charity. And the company is 99% is of our wealth, so we need those dividends to be able to, to fund our charitable endeavors, okay? They said, we don't really care about growth, right? It could be a $500 million business, it could be a $5 billion business, we don't really care, right? And that's this idea of sitting in the bottom area about liquidity and control. That growth isn't actually the focus, it happens, but it's a byproduct of some other choices that you've made. 
Now this can change over time, and I'll give you an example in a few minutes of, uh, of, sort of telling the story of a company's history by thinking about how these choices have evolved. But for, you know, for example, some families might go from you know, growth and control focus to growth and liquidity. Um, there's a family I was working with in Southeast Asia. They owned a bunch of gas stations, um, and they like the business, but they also could look ahead. They're thinking about 50 years from now, and they're saying, look, there's gonna come a time when there, maybe, maybe there are as many gas stations as there, as there are now. So what they did is they sold 40% of the business to an outside investor, um, and they used that money to go spend and invest in other areas. And in the process, they noticed that for the first time, there were other people sitting in their boardroom other than just the family members, and those were the outside investor. Right? So they're giving up some level of control in order to get there. Um, or you might say, well, we have to, we're going to focus on you know, growth and you know, control for a while, but maybe we need to I work with another family. Um, they had always grown organically, um, and they had gotten so successful that when they started to do the estate planning, the numbers were looking very scary. Um, you know, I just tell people that Uncle Sam is your biggest business partner, um, and Uncle Sam wants half, right? Uh, of your business. And um, if you don't plan around that estate reality, uh, when people die, that will be an existential threat to the business, and you do see businesses that fail. Um, and so this is a family that kind of woke up and say, wow, this thing has grown far beyond what we ever imagined, and that's a nice thing to have, a nice, nice thing to have happened, but we had to figure out this estate planning issue. And so they actually decided for a period of time to slow the growth down in the business, use the money that they were gonna generate from that to, to solve their estate problem and therefore position the business to be successful. So you could think about these as choices that you're making depending on what's happening out there. You can also think about this not just as a single business but as a portfolio of businesses, right? So um, one of the families I know, they, they had the original business, um, they took that public, so they sort of brought that over into this growth liquidity dimension over here. Um, they still have a private company and they use some of the capital from taking that company public uh, to, uh, to kind of reinvest in this business that was sort of in the growth and control retained earnings space. Um, and they also had a real estate business and the, real, the job of the real estate business was to generate some annual consistency of dividends through rents and so on so that people had a sort of a standard amount that they could, they could live on. Right? And so you can actually think about this not just from an individual business but where, does, where do each of your businesses fit on this portfolio, okay? So, um, you know, each, you know, life involves trade-offs and each of these patterns involves trade-offs. And so, for example, if we're thinking about focusing on growth and control, um, then we really have to manage people's expectations about distributions, right? If we're funding the business through retained earnings, then if people start to have a certain lifestyle and that gets in the way of the ability of the business to grow, we're gonna run into a very difficult, difficult conversation. Right? So actually learning to set those expectations to say, you know, look, we pay out some amount, but it really depends on how the business is doing, and it's gonna go through ups and downs. You know, having people think about their dividends as a, an equity, right, with ups and downs, as opposed to as an annuity that's flat. If we're focusing on, you know, if we're taking a business public or bringing in outside investors, um, and you, as a way to take out some of the profits of the business, then we really have to be thoughtful about what control are we giving up? What are the things that really matter for us uh, to sort of hold on to? What decisions are critically important versus what are we more able to let go of? And then thinking back to that jewelry company um, where it's actually not about growth, well, it's still about growth. If businesses aren't expanding, they're not creating enough opportunity for people to be successful. But on the other hand, you really have to manage it. And what happened to this family, actually, the jewelry company, was they brought in a non-family CEO, and like virtually every non-family CEO I've ever come across, that person immediately decided the priority was to grow the business. Because that's what they've been trained to do in every business that they've ever worked, was to put the you know, foot on the accelerator and grow this thing as much as possible. What happened was that person made all these investments in international expansion and so on, um, and they looked at it, the owners looked at it six months later, and essentially they were being told there's no, gonna be no dividend this year uh, because we've spent all that money on new systems and overseas offices, and they're like, what are you talking about? What happened here, right? So they got out of alignment about what their, what their priorities were. 
Um, I've actually done a little bit of research. This is from a, a sort of a, a live survey I did a few years ago, but the pattern really holds, you know, what is it that most family businesses are focusing on? Um, most, and most often, they'll be curious when you, on your tables when you think about what you've focused and prioritized on. In general, most families are in this growth and control mindset. Um, controlling of the business is actually turns out to be something that allows you to sustain it across time. Um, there, but there were some in the other categories as well. But oftentimes, that's sort of the dominant approach that families take. Now, as I said, this is something that evolves over time. It's not necessarily static. You know, it could be that there are you know, external factors that make you think about some changes. You know, it could be the business cycle, or if you're going through a period of consolidation, you may need to decide either we're going to be standing there at the end, or we're going to be one of the ones that exits and you know, moves towards a different strategy. Um, or it could be internal factors. You know, it could be a generational transition where one generation has different priorities, different objectives um, than, than the other. Uh, and those kind of factors can also drive you to sort of say, well, maybe this, um, this, the way that we've been thinking about our goals has evolved and is different than it was, uh, than it was before. So I'll just give you an example of how that happens in, in practice. This is, a, this is a, fa a company in the construction business, and you can see this red line here is their revenue, which starts around zero. So it's a founded company founded around uh, 1980, uh, gets up to a peak of a little over $3 billion, uh, a little bit of a trough, and then back. I'll talk more about that in a second. The dotted line um, is how much of their after-tax profit they paid out in dividends, right? And so you can see here, it was actually, for a long period of time, it was zero, then went up to 50%, and then down to about 25%. I want to tell you why, because there's actually, I always find it fascinating to look at these kinds of, this kind of information. It always tells you a story. In this case, we can think about this story um, as being an evolution in how they've thought about um, their owner strategy and their trade-offs. So, like many business founding success stories, um, this was an example of sort of the growth and control mindset growing through retained earnings. Um, in this case, they you know, would, would uh, build a house, sell it, take almost all of the money, put that back into building two houses, so on and so forth, and it is able to scale over time. No dividends, paying themselves just enough salary to kind of make ends meet, putting almost everything they could back into the business, right? And then, you know, they did well. You, know, you can see, grew, grew a billion dollar business, um, were, uh, were successful doing so, and then at one time, the, the founders came and said, you know, we, we've done well enough. Um, it's not really about us so much anymore, um, or not as much as, as before. Um, what we really want to do is to give 50% of our net worth to charity, right? But we don't want to do it the way that a lot of people, they sell the business, they put 50% in the foundation. That's not, we love this business. We think this business is actually the best investment out there. So instead, what we're going to do is we'll take 50% of the profit every year and give that to charity, right? So they did, that's they shifted towards the sort of over in the triangle, they said, but we want to keep growing, keep this engine going, and so they borrowed, you know, significantly to kind of fill in the gap. So they take out a bunch of money, they borrow from banks to kind of put it back in there, um, and they use that debt to invest in growth. That worked really well, as you can see, pretty extraordinary uh, run for a period of time. And then that little number that's covered there is 2007, 2008. Some of you may remember what happened around that time in the housing business. It's a little bit challenging, right? Um, and so that re required a, a reflection. What do we do now? Um, how do we adjust our priorities for this reality um, that the, the business is actually going through a tough time? Um, and so they shifted down into that bottom part of the triangle. They said, look, we need to pay down the debt. We also probably need to slow, the, slow our growth rate back, you know, let's, let's sort of like take a, take a beat, let's, uh, let's make sure everyone is in, in, in a good shape, and then we'll kind of, you know, grow further from there. Um, and we don't want to go, you know, we don't want to stop giving away to charity, but maybe we need to do less for a period of time. So they reduced that amount, but they also said consciously, we're going to grow the business at a slower rate for this period of time, right? And you could see, and some of you may have experienced some of these changes, and you can kind of understand the, the ways in which those priorities shift by using some of these lenses. All right, so when you think about goals at your table in your conversations, um, I want you to talk to each other about how have you, you know, what have the goals that you've been identified, have you set any concrete goals? Um, and then I want you to think about, if you sort of draw that triangle, where is, has your business been over the last five years? What have you prioritized? What have you been doing more of? 
What have you been willing to have less of? Um, and then what about the future? Is that gonna change? Are your priorities similar or different? And, um, and if so, why? Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. So let's talk about, now we've kind of, as I said, we're kind of cascading our way down um, into from the most abstract and broad understandings to the most specific, um, which is getting into this notion of, of guardrails. And think about guardrails as sort of how do you know if you're, if you're on track or off track. Guardrails are the things that keep you from going over the other side. Um, and you can use them to really shape the decisions that are made by the leaders of your business. And you may be those leaders. It may be that you are an owner and also you know, the, the manager. But it's still a really valuable conversation to sort of say, these are the things that will tell us if we're on track or off track. Um, and you can use them in a couple different ways. One is they can set some boundary conditions. So what is required or what is not allowed? Like are there certain things that we are definitely always going to do no matter what? Like we're always going to take care of our employees. Um, we're always going to be responsible members of the community. Um, or are there certain things that we're never going to do? Right? in terms of certain businesses or industries that you might say, we're just not going to invest in those. Even if those might be profitable, they're just not the right things for us. Okay? You can also use them to set a floor or a ceiling of expectations. Right? And to say, for example, um, you know, we, want to, we want to grow at least as much as the average company in our industry. Right? Or we want to produce at least a $100,000 dividend for the family every year just to kind of keep people happy and satisfied as shareholders. So it's setting a floor. Or it might be a ceiling. You know, for example, um, you know, we are not going to borrow any more than three times our earnings because if we do that, that can put us at risk if, if our business starts to go south as it happens over the course of a business cycle. So think about it as guardrails are trying to ultimately put the decision makers of your company in some sort of box. Right? Think about that. That's the playing field. You know, where can we play? Where is out of bounds? Right? But you know, this is one of the challenges of being an owner of a business is that you have to find some space in the middle. Because if you're too broad and too general, it's not going to help those that are making decisions actually know what to do. Should we be growing this thing more aggressively? Should we be diversifying? What should be our priorities? Help us to understand what matters to you. On the other hand, if you shrink the box so small, then there's no room for anyone to operate, right? And that's gonna be a really hard position uh, you know, for a business leader. They're not gonna have enough flexibility to actually be responsive to the market conditions. And ultimately, it's gonna be hard to find people that are gonna to wanna to play in that role if they don't have enough uh, you know, room to actually go and try and do things. So you're trying to create a playing field that has some boundaries and shape to it but enough room to play, enough room to try things out, enough room to kind of uh, you know, experiment and, and drive the business forward under the, the basic rules that you've set. Right? And so we think about these as the, the guardrails, kind of keeping us in line. Um, and we'll talk about sort of two main flavors or kinds. We'll talk about financial guardrails that set some standards of performance that align with your goals as owners. And then for lack of a better term, we'll talk about non-financial guardrails. And think about these as not, you know, outcomes uh, that you are willing to sacrifice some level of financial performance to achieve, right? They're more important than the extra dollar or, you know, whatever, hundred dollars that you would get uh, by going down those routes. So, um, financial guardrails come in lots of different kinds. Um, this is sort of giving you kind of a bit of a laundry list. Um, and you can kind of think about how they, they align with these different priorities. Um, there are some that are focusing on growth. You know, you can think about, you know, some measures of returns, you know, return on invested capital or your total shareholder return, the value of the asset, how is it going up over time, is it worth more, you know, five years, uh, five years from now than it is today. Um, some are more about liquidity, you know, saying do we have, you know, are we, are we paying out a reasonable amount of the business's uh, profit? And what's our dividend payout ratio and so on. I mentioned that the, in the example, they went from a 50, you know, 0% to 50% to 25%. Um, and then there are some control metrics to sort of say, are we in a position to make sure the business stays in the family for a period of time? 
Um, you know, debt is often the thing that, um, if you're not careful, can be the killer of businesses. The story that always resonated with me uh, was Toys R Us, um, and that's probably as a, a father of now 11-year-old twins, I can tell you with some confidence that Toys R Us did not go out of business because kids don't like toys. Um, I can also tell you with a degree of confidence that Toys R Us did not go out of business because kids don't like going to toy stores. It turns out they do. Um, the reason Toys R Us went out of business was because they borrowed a bunch of money. There was a leveraged buyout by like a private equity fund, um, and they owed a huge amount. You know, a lot of the, the profit was going to pay down the debt holders. The business was taking a gradual decline as Amazon and others were encroaching on their business, and they lost the ability to pay out, pay out the creditors. Bankruptcy, right? Bed Bath & Beyond just went through a similar, similar story. So if you want your business to be around for the long term, and you want control, you want to keep it in the hands of the family, one of the things that you have to pay a lot of attention to is how much you're borrowing, right? Debt could be an incredible instrument for growth. Like, I'm not, I'm not in any way negative on it, but you have to be careful about it. And so understanding what is a reasonable level, not usually zero, but what is a reasonable level to help you do that, right? This is a long list. This is just kind of a starting point. Let me give you an example. This is from an actual family business that went through this process of saying, how do we define success from a financial perspective? And they said, you know, in general, you should know more than this. I would say folk, try to focus on, from an owner's perspective, somewhere between three and six metrics, financial metrics, that give you a good handle on whether or not the business is healthy. And they focused on these six. One was total shareholder return. They looked at their return on their invested capital, uh, their earnings growth. This is the debt thing. They make sure that debt was no higher than 1.5 times their earnings. And if it went above that, it was for a period of time. And then they would again get back below it. And then they looked at their dividend payout ratio. Uh, less than 20% of net profits over a five-year period. It went up and down a little bit, um, but in general they said, it's healthy for us as shareholders to take 20% of the annual profits. More than that, I mean, we might be starving the business for its ability to grow, right? This is not an answer, this is just an example. But it's the kind of thing that you want to be looking at to saying, how do we know from a financial perspective if we are on track or off track, and can we set some floors or ceilings, right? So. This is an example of a floor. You know, we want to make sure that EBIT, EBITDA growth is at least 4%. If it's 8%, is anyone going to be unhappy? No, that's great, that's fantastic. You grew twice as much as we, as we wanted, that's fantastic. If it's 2%, though, then we start to ask the question, is the business healthy? Um, because if earnings aren't growing, earnings are the things that we use, you can't pay your bills, you know, you can't you know, pay your personal bills with revenue. You have to pay the company's bills first, and then you get to take out some of that in a dividend. If you don't have earnings, you don't have the ability to reinvest, and you don't have the ability to help out the shareholders, right? So thinking about what are the metrics that you want to use and to define success in your, in your business. And then there are non-financial things. As I said, not a great term. It's just that they are other things that people also place value on. Um, in some family businesses, uh, having a family leader is really important. I was talking to one CEO of a, of a shipping company in, in South America, and, and he said, look, I'd rather the business grow slower than lose out on the opportunity for my kids to, to run it. Like, I just care. And others will say, no, we want the best person. Doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a descendant, an in-law, a non-family member. You know, we don't care as long as it's the right person. Is this important to you or not? How important is it to have family leadership? Um, what about the scope of the business? Are there areas that you want to avoid investing in? Are there certain businesses that you wouldn't do, um, you know, even if they could make you money because they're counter to their values? Or are there things that you, you know, you'd want to sustain even if they're unprofitable? Uh, I was talking to a Brazilian company and they started out in the steel business um, decades and decades ago and since they've expanded into lots of other companies. Um, and they, they should have sold, the, from a pure profitability standpoint, the, the steel business was terrible. Like they were, Brazil was non-competitive with, with uh, other, you know, other countries these days. They should have sold it, but they felt like that's who we are. You know, we started out as this company, right? And so they were willing to actually lose some money um, because it was so important to them. Um, family harmony, are there certain decisions that you'll be, you'll, you will make to preserve relationships? I was talking to someone else who is, um, their family owns a bunch of different businesses. Uh, one of them is a real estate development business and it was not doing very well. And, and uh, this person was saying, you know, I would love to shut it down, 
but that business happens to be run by my brother-in-law. And if I shut the business down, he's out of a job, and now my sister is going to be come talking to me at every holiday about why did you fire my husband. Um, and so these things are kind of get into the complexities. And some, you might say to some extent, we can live with that, right? But how much of that? And is that a, you know, how much of that's healthy? How much of that's ultimately destructive to the business? And then lastly, you know, there are all kinds of business practices that, um, that, that family businesses have that are, are different. That, you know, in terms of, like I said, paying attention to employees. Um, I was talking to another, another business. They, they're in, um, they make these uh, specialized parts for airlines. Uh, really cool business. Um, it was actually, I had one of them come to class, one of the CEOs, um, and he'd hold up this bag of, uh, of washers, like that you'd get at Home Depot for about 10 bucks or whatever. He'd ho hold it up and he'd ask the students, how much do you think this cost? Um, and they'd come up with a number, like $50, $100, whatever. He's like, $50,000 for this bag of washers. And that's because they're for an airplane, Right? And everything that goes inside of an airplane has to meet the precise exact specifications as, the, as it was originally done by the manufacturer. And you have to go through this entire accreditation process in order, in order to do that. Right? So they have done that and built up this incredibly, one of the more profitable uh, businesses out there over 30 years by being able to find these very specialized products. But I was talking to them because you know, after in COVID, as you can imagine, that was not a great time to be in the air travel business. Um, and he was saying that most of their competitors, these public companies and so on, were almost bragging about how many people they fired. Like, it was a badge of honor. We, we fired 5,000 people. We fired 10,000 people. It was a way to signal their seriousness to investors, um, that, they, that they cared about their money and weren't just going to let these employees sit around doing nothing. And they said, you know, we, we did have to fire some people for the first time in our company's history, but we did everything we could to avoid that. We put people on furloughs. We, we, we dropped our salaries to almost nothing. We took every possible measure to try not to fire people, right? And that was the right thing to do, but then when business came back, they were in a great position, whereas a lot of their competitors were having to try and recruit those people back who they'd, uh, who they'd fired when, when the business didn't go well. So there are some business practices that, you know, that are oftentimes really important. You'd say, even if there's a financial cost to these things, First of all, we just believe they're the right things to do, and we also believe that in the long term that those things are gonna, they're gonna pay off, right? And what are those things, right? Qualifying or quantifying those, or at least identifying them. And so these are some examples of you know, what some non-financial guardrails can look like. So you know, one company I know has a, a policy that you know, they would like to have a family leader. They, they see value, and certainly in my experience, there's nothing better than a family business run by a family member. There's certain things you can do as an owner of a business that you can't do as someone who's not. On the other hand, there are a few things worse than a, uh, fa a family business that's run by an unqualified uh, family, family member, right? So having some, some understanding, and this is kind of where they landed after having this conversation was, we would love to have a family member run this company if they're qualified, right? If they're as qualified as someone we could find on the open market, they said it's kind of like tie goes to the runner. If they're about on the same plane, family member gets it because there are certain things they can do that a non-family member can't. Um, you can think about examples of employee engagement, like being on the best places to work list or m monitoring your net promoter score, how, how excited are employees to work at your business. Um, some families focus on environmental sustainability rules, or you know, we're not going to invest in the gambling industry. There's one company I know that's uh, a chemical in the chemical business, and they can make a lot of money selling their products to cigarette manufacturers, but they basically said, uh, we're not going to do that um, because it's counter to our values. Or you might say, look, um, I remember when uh, you know, I have a lot of family in Seattle, and when, and when Boeing moved their headquarters from Seattle to Chicago, that was a really big disruptive thing. It turned out it was okay because there's a company called uh, Amazon and so on that ended up taking over. It was okay in Seattle. Uh, they're doing quite well now. But at the time, it was kind of a, it was kind of a big problem. Um, I know lots of family businesses, billion-dollar companies that have never moved from their the headquarters in a small town. They say, no matter, even though there's a challenge, there's a cost of doing this, this is who we are, and we don't want to leave this community, right? And that might be important to you. It might not be. Um, so thinking about what are those things that matter to you, that you, and then the, again, the test is, are you willing to sacrifice at least some short-term 
uh, financial performance to get them. That's really the way you know that it's, it's something that you should put some specificity around and try to say, what are those things? And let's not treat them as too squishy. Let's try to put some ways of understanding them. How do we know if we care about employees and they're happy, how do we know if they're happy? There's some great ways and metrics to do and measure almost all of these things. All right, so what I want you to think about in a couple minutes when I turn you over to your groups is you know, think about these questions. Have you, have you defined guardrails? Um, and what, if so, what are they? Are they financial things? Are they non-financial things? How do you know? Um, and how do you know if your business is on track or off track? If you think about, you have a sense of what success means, how do you know if you're getting closer there or if you start to deviate away from there? Um, and then lastly, one thing that's really important is to make sure that your guardrails are, are aligned with how you're providing incentives to your team. Right? I worked with one family where the family was thinking long-term, uh, you know, increasing the value of the asset. That was the primary thing they looked at. Our business is worth a you know, million dollars this year or, or 20 years ago. Now it's worth 100. In five years, we'd like to be worth 500. Um, but they were compensating their CEO based upon annual earnings, right? And so one was pushing, you know, they're thinking long-term investments, long-term plays. CEO is thinking, how do I drive earnings so I can maximize my, my bonus check this year? So are these things aligned with each other? Have you thought about how to make sure that, that everyone is sort of uh, rowing in the same direction? All right, so just to kind of put it all together, um, one of the things that can be really helpful is to develop what we call an owner strategy statement. You can call this whatever you want. Some families call it their owner objectives. Um, one family calls it their shareholder expectations letter. It's actually a letter that they write out and deliver to the board um, once a year. They, they like look at it and make sure it fits with what they're trying to accomplish. But whatever you call it, having this sort of you know, statement that says, you know, here's why we're in business together, Here's what's more important to us. Here's what's less important to us. And here's how we want to really understand if we're on track or off track. Um, and it should be, try to be specific. One of the reasons why we started to develop this whole methodology is that family businesses for, for forever have done mission statements and so on. And they're helpful, but they're too broad. It's like two sentences. The question is, how does it help people to make decisions? And you know you've been successful um, when the board or the management team is able to say, okay, I know what to do here, and I know what not to do, right? So does it help people to actually make decisions? Um, translate it into a dashboard, you know, and again, it's not like one of those management dashboards might have like 50 metrics and so on. This might have like five things on it, right? These are the five things that we will know if our business is on track or whether it's off track. And of course, it's a living document. It's something that you have to revisit and say, does this reflect not only where we were, but where we are and where we're going. Um, you know, as you're doing this work, um, it's really helpful to have a process that is inclusive. Um, the purpose in particular should speak not just to the owners of the business, but to the entire family, um, all of them. Um, you want to try to bring in the perspective, and this is true mostly for those of you who have larger families, where you know, it may be a smaller group that's doing the work or making decisions, but bringing in the group, the broader group, to have some, some buy-in and some uh, belief in the, in the outcome. And then and one of the things I found really helpful is to engage the board, engage the management team in this process, uh, where it really feels like a collective, a collective effort. I mentioned already you know, aligning incentives, making sure that if we say our goals are you know, in this direction, Let's make sure that everyone is also being, you know, has the incentives to do those same things. Um, and then create a, a way to talk about it. You know, this is most helpful when you bring it, when you bring it to life. You know, and that could be, um, you know, in your family meetings discussing it, but also especially for those of you that have more structured boards and management teams, having some joint meetings where you sit down with and together around a table and, you know, talk about here's where our priorities are, um, what are the big trends in the business? Are there things that we should be aware of? Um, what the family I mentioned that has their shareholder expectations letter, um, the company has been on just an incredible uh, you know, success path recently, and the board's kind of asking them, what do you want us to do with the excess capital? You know, should we be putting more into the core business? Should we be diversifying? Do you want that capital? Do you want to go invest it in things outside the business? It's become a dialogue and a, really, and a really healthy one. So creating some spaces to have conversations about what does success mean 
um, and, and what do you do about the choices that are in front of you uh, in practice. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, and what I want to do, as I said, the fun part is for you all to actually have some conversations. So why do we take, we'll take 45 minutes till 10.15, and we'll take a break after that. Um, I want you to spend about 15 minutes on each of these three layers, right? So in your, in your table, spend about 15 minutes, could be a little more, a little less. I want you to talk about, um, you know, purpose, right? And, you know, how do you think about the why question in your, in your family businesses? So how do you have those conversations? I want you to think about goals and the trade-offs between growth, liquidity, and control. How have you made them? Um, you know, and, and where is that going? And then guardrails. How do you know if you're, you're on track or off track? Um, and I'll ask you also to, to choose someone. It could be also be more than some. If you want to sort of divvy it up and have one person on each topic, uh, but at least choose, choose at least one spokesperson so that we, we do get back together, um, we can sort of hear from each of the tables. Okay, everyone clear? All right, get to work. What I thought we would do is just kind of go around and have, uh, have folks just share a couple of things from your conversation um, so that we can kind of get the benefit of, uh, from each of your different dialogues. So let's, um, I'll just come over. I'm going to start right here in the middle. All right, who's our, do you have, do you have a spokesperson? Okay. So share with us, tell, tell us what you all, tell us what you all Oh. Not only did she get drafted, she had Oh my gosh. Okay, I, we talked about everything. I don't even know. I do think it was interesting. I think most of us were, um, we loved the, we, I think most of us are growth and control, um, which is interesting. And then trying to figure out, which I guess I can say because my husband's not here anymore, that he would, is always saying, well, wait, where are the dividends? What's going on? So it's an interesting conversation of trying to figure out that balance. Um, we also had a really good part of the conversation, which I think was a little bit off, but for purpose and getting our long-term and just employees on, involved of how to incentivize them. Because as owners, this is what we've decided, but if they want maybe more income or different pieces. So um, it, was, it was a great conversation. <laughs> well, <laughs> you definitely made the right choice. And I think this whole idea of how do you, how do you bring it to life and especially not just, the, you know, not just the family, but also the employees, how you make this so that if this is what the company is all about, that everyone is kind of pushing in the same direction. So that's a, a great, great way to do it. All right, come back here. Do you have all the spokesperson? You're welcome. So we had a really good group, and Mike was very brave to be the only man at a, a table with very strong women. So we, we did kind of wander just a little bit, but we... Mike made sure we did the assignment. So we are growth and control, for sure, whether we're small to large businesses, that was consistent. Um, goals were at various stages of development, is that fair? Um, and that we did decide that ownership goals were the most challenging to define. Um, purpose, Balancing family and business needs is the toughest conversation that we have, whether we're large or small. And guardrails, not always explicitly defined. We're currently in the process of defining as a group. And um, the per what we recognize is the person with positional authority um, has control over either implicitly or explicitly setting the guardrails. So there's also probably some responsibility that goes there. Nice. nice job. Uh, let's go over here. Ryan, you the volunteer? Hello, hello. Uh, we had a great discussion. We talked, we laughed. Dare I say we learned something today about each other? Uh, it was great. But, you know, one of the things that stood out was all of us sort of were thinking about liquidity and how kind of not important extra money is, right? It was a really interesting thing to think about how kind of content we are in our lives and thinking about, well, what else could we do with those funds or how might we be able to invest it? And so I thought that was pretty inspiring from the group. Uh, and then the other thing that was interesting was everyone was very dialed in in terms of thinking about what their company purpose and mission is, but maybe we didn't know what our family mission or vision was. We all kind of have it in our head and we could discuss it, but it's not written down. It's not a guiding light that 
each of us live by. And so I think that was one thing that uh, we all wanted to take away was thinking about how we might craft that and actually, you know, make it something tangible that we can execute against. That's great. Excellent. Anyone else? And I, and I think crafting it is, is, is really good. And a lot of it um, is sort of how do you bring it to life? I think when the panelists were talking yesterday about, you know, bringing people, the, the kids when they're young, into the experience, they start to build that emotional connection to it. Um, but looking for ways to sort of, you know, share in that passion. And that's one of the things that if you can, if you can hand over that sense of why and that passion and bring that to the next generation, that's going to motivate them to want to learn all the, the technical details. All that stuff will come. Right, but really developing that as early as you can, and, and oftentimes making the implicit explicit can help in that conversation because it's intuitive in some ways to in those earlier stages. But um, helping to sort of capture that and then use that as a platform for bringing others into it, awesome stuff. All right, I'll come over to this group here. We have a, volu a volunteer to share some of what you talked about. Thank you very much. Our uh, nominated spokesperson smartly didn't make her way back here, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, we really didn't make it past purpose because um, we all feel like we're still really trying to hammer that part out and come up with the values and um, you know we're still all in that growth control part of our businesses and it's hard to take time to work on something like this but it is uh, important to. Any. Um were there themes as you were talking about what your, your purpose was? Was there anything that you sort of felt that was common or, or different or each their own? Yeah, Jean. I'm gonna say from my perspective, I think each person talked a little bit about their challenges. So we really didn't get to the purpose too much, but I found for our group, I felt that there was just a lot of support for everybody in all of their challenges, and we're all, we were all trying to listen. And Dr. Stacy was very good at, <laughs> at keeping it all going, so I'm sorry she's not here, but yeah. Great, so you didn't quite do the assignment I gave you, but you still got, but you still got a lot out of it, which is, no, I'm, I'm, being, I'm kidding. It's, no, I think this is a really, it's hard to find groups of people that you can almost instantly get to conversations and you kind of know where each other's coming from because you've dealt with some of the same challenges. It's one of the real values of, of these kinds of events and, and really wonderful to have the chance to, to do whatever, you know, to really have those, those conversations. So thank you. All right. Who's going to speak from this table? Right. I, got, I, got, I got voluntold that I was doing this. Um, we did discuss like where we were on the business triangle. Hello. Um, and then we went over just the similarities and differences that we were having in terms of like how do you compensate family members that are in the business, not in the business, um, how you make things equitable versus fair. I'm a big fan of fair over equitable. Um, and our family, um, I had to advocate for my sister and I not to get paid the same because mom was paying us the same, but our job wasn't the same. Now, and so that had to come from me because my sister was supposed to make more at the time. But I was in sales, I could make more if I wanted to. It was based on performance. But, but, that, but I do think that that's important to discuss. Those are important things, and I, you had even shared just in families, equitable is a really complicated conversation, so discussing it and the power of actually bringing it up and knowing where people, what people are thinking and feeling um, is valuable. Yeah, as, as mentioning also, there's, uh, for those who are interested, there's, I wrote a piece called Merit and Inherit, which kind of talks about how you balance you know, what people are given versus what they earn. Um, that might be sort of, a, this, is a, this is one of the kind of core conversations in, uh, in a family business is you know, what is fair and who gets what and how do we manage that. And these conversations here are going to inevitably get into some of those topics and ideally help you through them. Um, by being more explicit, by having you know, policies and rules on things like a dividend policy so that we're clear you know, how people are benefiting from it. One of the good things that comes out of this hopefully is a greater degree of alignment and, and hopefully getting away, uh, getting into some of the tough conversations and avoiding them becoming too personalized because that's oftentimes when things get off track. Okay, great, nice job. Um, who over here is talking? Murph, all right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we, we were uh, more like table four. We didn't really get through the assignment. 
which is a good follow-up for you, Josh, by the way. Um, uh, but we did learn a lot about each other's companies. We talked a lot about, we're, we're definitely, we have two found, uh, first generation and three second generation, oh, three first generation and two second generation. Um, so growth and control kind of came up as a theme. And um, I think that um, we all like know each other better and we feel like we've, we had a great discussion. I thought it was fantastic. We just didn't get to all through the assignment, Josh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fortunately for you, there are no grades coming out of this session, and uh, there's no bad conversation. I mean, it sounds like uh, it, was, it was a useful start, and, and encourage you all to, to continue these conversations, yeah. One thing, I, I think you referenced it earlier, perhaps everybody feels this way, but just getting comfort from knowing somebody else is going through the same issue is like worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And so I think I felt that, I don't know if you guys felt that, but it's like, yeah, it's great, I'm not the only one. Yes. So. No, I think it, the, I, it can be very isolating to be in a business and, and it's really, these are conversations that are oftentimes hard to talk about. And if you try talking about them to people who aren't in that environment, they can come across as sort of a privileged or whatever, but these are like real issues that, that are part of your life and, and having a group of people that you know, are here because they're dealing with some similar things is, is just really really beneficial. It also helps to normalize. I mean, everyone will say, well, we must be the most messed up family you've ever met. Well, of course not. You're a family. You know, family staff, yeah, okay, okay. No, um, it's, it's helpful to see that others are also going through talking about dealing with some of these same, same, same topics. So, great, awesome. So I got elected spokesperson because Ellen wants to save her voice for later today on the tour at the, at the winery, she can't wait to talk all about the winery, so she, she asked me to speak. Um, yeah, we kind of didn't follow the assignment as well, <laughs> not surprising with a bunch of business owners, but uh, we have uh, mostly second generation, one first generation. Um, we're all very much in the control and growth mode of our businesses, but we all did realize that we need to start setting some guidelines as the third generation is coming, or more of the second generation is coming. So um, we, we, we had great discussion, and, uh, but yeah, we didn't really follow the rules as, as much as we probably should. I know, exactly right. That's the way, I mean, entrepreneurs are like, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you always follow the rules, you probably wouldn't start a business, right? But, um, but I do think, I mean, it's, it's an important realization that you know, it, you wanna, it's very easy to stay kind of head down, focused on, on the business, and, and that, like you have to do that, otherwise there's nothing to really talk about and worry about for the next generation. Um, but at the same time, really sort of taking at least some time and maybe carving out some time where you're having these conversations and make sure that you're checking in on wh what's the why, why are we doing this, and how do we know if we're on track or off track. Um, these are really valuable kind of conversations to, to start and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get out of the mode of just focusing on, on the day-to-day -day stuff. Good. Awesome. All right. Who do we got? Thank you. Hello. I'm Penny Wagner from Wagner Fortress Group. Um, we jumped right into where we were on the triangle and interestingly enough, our table, um, does, was not mostly growth and control. Um, we have total growth that's now going into growth and liquidity. Liquidity and control, another liquidity and control, and then growth and liquidity. So it's really interesting to talk about what, uh, what is it that we're doing in our businesses that are, that are um, leading to, to that part of the triangle. And then we really got into transition from there, um, how, transitioning the, to, from one generation to the next and how to implement the values and the ownership mindset that we have as it's going down into, um, into the next uh, generations, how to bring that all together. So I think we, we are all working on what those guardrails look like um, and putting those into place and actually defining them. Yeah. So, Any good lessons about the how? Any examples from that, you'd all, that you all share? Uh, how to put them in place? Yeah, or, or how to sort of, yeah, well, the values. you know, okay, so 
interesting. Um, we've uh, at Wagner Porch Group are talking about that a lot because we have a lot of employees, are basically our photographers, who live in other regions and they they don't get to experience the culture that that we're building within. Uh, within the office and we're, we, we talk about, we have defined values and they're posted all over the place. Basically what we're trying to do now is when we, we get a lot of, uh, we have a feedback system for every, every photo shoot that's done, every uh, picture day coordinator uh, gets something that asks how their experience was. And um, when those come in, we identify the experience with the value. So then we broadcast that to the company to say, this is how um, empathy was put into place. Um, and so that there are real live examples and they're um, uh, highlighting how, uh, how employees are actually living those values in, a, in the day-to-day -day workplace. Fantastic. And I, and I think, you know, thinking about that way, of how can you bring that also into the family side? How can you talk about the values? How can you make them real so that people start to in, internalize and telling stories about them, um, sharing experiences about them, all these different, you know, you can apply something similar sort of say, okay, how do, we, how do we start to make this feel like something that's not just a piece of paper, but we live this and here's how we know that we live it. Good, excellent. All right, what about over here? Okay, Chris, you will. <laughs> Voluntold. Reluctantly, Rich was uh, giving me the eye. We, um, we also were not uh, rule followers. We uh, did not follow your mission. We apologize. But we had a great conversation. Um, two folks have already done the purpose guardrails um, part of their business. They spoke at great length about it. Um, one person thought that they had it done pretty well for the business, but they were more worried about the family um, part of it, and they wanted to address that. Um, it, was, it was a good conversation, but um, not much as far as uh, your mission you put us on. <laughs> Did I leave anything out? We didn't talk about a triangle. <laughs> but we talked the whole time. No shapes involved at all. All right, that's okay. Good, no, sounds like it sounds like a really good, a really good discussion, and hopefully those that have been through the process shared a little bit of that experience about what it was like. Good, all right. Sam, are you up? Um, I was the last at my table to say not it. And, uh, and so, and I wasn't smart enough to stay in my room and not come back in time. But um, no, we had a great discussion. Uh, multiple family businesses were all in G2 at, at our table. We were able to um, talk about how we've heard of purpose and goals, but we really um, appreciated the new vocabulary that, that we gained in here. In particular, guardrails. That was, that was a new word, new concept for, for our table. And so in terms of the how-to, we also had one member of the table share how he'd read the book, and there's a concept of four rooms in, in your book. And, and so that was new too. So, so we're all looking forward to getting back and reading that chapter on four rooms and, and having that in terms of conversations. We also all mentioned how we learned so much from the panel yesterday and today in terms of just amazing families. So it's just learning from each other. And uh, we also joined all the uh, others who, who, who did not do the assignment on the triangle. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. I miss anyone? Uh, what about any just final comments, questions, anything else that's on, on your minds? As you're sitting here? Yeah. Thanks. So <clears throat> I had a. I, I guess this is for your opinion on this. So we heard growth and control, like a ton, right? It was on your slide. And like, I'm reading the book and like, I feel like my father's name is like under the circle, growth and control, right? Um, do you think that's out of fear or, do, or what is the driver that's pre preventing that? Because I think everybody in this room is successful and, and I'll say from a financial standpoint, but it, it, it's like, why don't we take that leap to, I mean, if I wasn't in our family business, I think I'd be making double what I make right now, yeah. somewhere. But why, don't, why doesn't the human take that leap to pay themselves appropriately? Yeah. Well, um, I think that's a, that's a really great question. And, and partly, hopefully what comes out of some of these conversations is starting to wrestle with the, exactly those topics. Why, um, in my experience at least, why do people do it? Um, sometimes it is fear. Um, I think people worry about what the impact of, of wealth on their family. And, and honestly, when people 
talk about wealth, what they're really talking about is liquidity. That it, you know, it's not, if you're, you can be worth a certain number on a piece of paper, but if you can't spend it, you know, what people really worry about is money that is able to be spent, especially if it's not earned. That's sort of like the, you know, the real big worry that most, uh, most parents have about, about their children, that money will corrupt them in some way. So some of it is fear. Um, some of it is actually, uh, you know, the passion for the business and to say, you know, it almost feels disloyal to take money out of the, of the business and to use it for anything else because this is, again, it's an identity. It's not a job. It's, it's sort of like part of, it's an extension of, of who you are. And it's to sort of to starve that, to get stuff, sort of feels wrong for, for some people. Um, and so I think part of it is, you know, um, there's a level at which I think it's a pretty extraordinary way to grow a company is through primarily through retained earnings. If you look at, um, for example, the largest, uh, the 10 largest private companies in the US, all like very big names, the average age of that group is 100 years. Um, and they did not get there over a, a you know, you know, a week or a year or even a decade. It's that constant process of reinvesting that can create some extraordinary companies. So the instinct is there, but like most things in life, when you take them to the extreme, they can be unhealthy. And one of the things that I've seen is that when a company doesn't actually have the conversation about taking money out, about what it, how much of this money should we reinvest versus not, it can actually be a negative for the business because the people working in it start to treat that capital as if it has no cost to it. And I've seen this actually happen in businesses where people will, okay, we might as well just buy another thing or invest in another, even though it's not actually healthy for the company. And so one of the roles of owners is actually to create an alternative for that capital, to do something else with it, which might be investing it in other businesses or giving it away or buying a boat or whatever. But that, that process seems like it should, it's negative. It's incredibly positive. There needs to be some sense that this capital, you know, we should only invest it if it's going to do good, right, for the company. Um, and so changing that mindset is actually, you know, can be challenging. Um, it's also healthy to sort of, for those that we talked to some, like, you know, we don't have any dividends. Well, you know, people aren't going to want to stay involved in, and play the long term of a company if they're, if they're only going to be able to monetize it by selling the entire thing. You're creating the wrong incentives. So I think partly it's getting out of some of that, you know, fear and concern and starting to say, when we talk about dividends, it's not because we're being greedy um, or we're trying to starve the business. It's saying we're trying to take a healthy attitude about what it's gonna take for the business to be successful over the long term. And that means engaging in this conversation and maybe moving like, you know, from here to here. Maybe not all the way over, taking all the money out, but, but maybe some amount of, of distributions is actually healthy, not just for the business, but also for the shareholders, which will then be long-term invested. So it's, um, it's a hard conversation and one that probably takes a few attempts, but, um, but I think getting towards a more dynamic view and a more thoughtful view of, of it can be helpful. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Josh. How much does the demographics, baby boomer, millennial, Gen X, uh, factor into the triangle and setting goals and, and, and all of this? Yeah, I th there's actually there's, um, a fair amount of research that says that we, every generation thinks the next generation is a bunch of uh, you know, not, the lazy, not working hard enough kind of people. And you kind of see this pattern recurring over and over again. So, um, I, t I tend not to put as much weight into um, this generation behaves that way versus that generation. Um, I do think that you know, the generation coming up you know, has, you know, every generation has a certain set of values and those values do evolve as society changes. You know, there's no question that the generation coming up you know, is more focused on you know, some of the environmental issues and so on. Not all, but some you know, more so than before. Uh, maybe more social justice. but. To me, you know, it's always going to be about values. The specific values may evolve as, as our society, uh, society changes and, and goes on. My experience is that a lot of this has to do less with the, the generation, um, and, but more with the family's experience. You know, when, when you know, I think about 
when we talk about culture, every family has its own culture, which is partially driven by wherever you grow up, but is a lot driven by your experience. And we sort of heard some of the panelists, when you've, when you've been through you know, uh, having your business taken away, you never get over that. Um, you're always going to be thinking about this as you know, more precious, more fragile. It will affect the way in which you, you behave. Or people that, you know, the people that if they grew up in the Great Depression, it doesn't matter how much money they have made in their lives, they still feel as though it could all be taken away and they could be poor tomorrow. And you're like, what are you talking about? There's no way. But that's their felt experience. And so I think a lot of this, how families experience and deal with these topics, has to do with what your own cumulative experience, the stories you tell inside of your business, the things, the things that you've been through. Um, I think that has a lot to do with how families are different and kind of think differently about some of these trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah, um, as you, typically G1 is a strong work, they have a strong work ethic and, and are um, primarily concerned as next generations G2 and G3 come along, not um, passing on those work ethics and not having an entitlement mentality and or a silver spoon as, as we affectionately sometimes call it. Um, how do you create those values or pass on that work ethic to G2, G3 as you move down the ladder? I mean, one thing honestly that I wish we would, I wrote this article about um, the third generation rule and I think there's a, there's a mythology around it. Because I actually think that's one of the things I would tell you not to do because I think it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, that we tell these stories about family businesses as if it's the first generation's the wealth creator, and then the second generation kind of rests on their laurels, the third generation, the family's poor again. Actually, there's not really any data to back, to back that idea up. Um, and in fact, if you look around at some of the great success stories, oftentimes it's the first generation that creates something, and then it's the second, third, fourth, 15th generation that comes along um, and really expands it. And so partly, I think, is getting out of this trap that you know, everything is going to be downhill from the, from the, from the founder. Um, but you know, a lot of it is actually having these conversations that we're, that we're talking about, about, about what does matter, about values, and helping people. So I was saying, like, the families that I've seen do this well, they start at birth. They don't talk about money from birth, right? But they talk about meaning from birth. Um, one of the families I know that has 200 shareholders um, they, every time a baby is born, they send them a, a book and a set of blocks that are you know, with the company's name on it. And the idea is that from the time that you are, you are born into this experience and you should start learning about it from the very beginning. And I think that the more that you can help people to see why you are so passionate about it, what is it, what is it that this brings to you in terms of meaning, what are your values, and you can bring them into that experience, I think that raises your odds. And then talking about values, Having a, an age and stage plan for when they start to you know, learn about money. You don't just want to like drop it on them when they're 30 years old, but you also don't want to make it a big deal when they're five or six about, you know what I mean? So there's, there's a thinking about it from a developmental perspective. Um, and, and that's really, I think, you know, those are the things that I've seen families that have navigated these experiences kind of do well. It's sort of trying to get out of the fear mentality. It's normal to be, we're all, you know, all parents are concerned that their kids are not going to grow up to, to be successful. But sometimes we place in a family business an added pressure on them that turns out actually to be unhealthy rather than healthy. Um, and then just finding ways to connect them through passion, through, through commitment, through meaning, um, and then bringing them into the fold in a gradual way so that it feels appropriate each stage. And they grow up as adults where this is just like, yeah, I know, I'm, this is different from other of my friends, but it's just kind of, it's the way I was raised, and I understand what this means, and, and, and I feel a sense of, of pride and purpose over it, not a sense of, of shame or fear. So. Thanks. Yesterday, someone, and I don't know if it was Dennis or who it was, but one of the quotes that I'm taking away from this whole thing is valuable values are, what is it, are catchable, not treat, not tra trainable, whatever. Caught, thank you, caught, not taught. Okay, I knew I'd get that. But I think if Gen 1, and I only know the experience of Gen 1 and my second gen after us, um, 
is that if we trust what we do as Gen 1, or let's say even Gen 3 passing on to Gen 4, trust what we're doing, that we are teaching them, you know? And they're out there, and they're gonna catch it. And as long as we have a respect for our second generation, or third, or fourth generation, they're going to do it very differently. That just is. Fantastic point. And I think that's actually one of the other things that can get in the way is when we expect them to do it the same way, right? And, you know, you know, I had to work every minute. I never took a weekend off. And maybe that's what the business needed. It probably it was what the business needed at that point. But once you get to a certain space, you don't have to do that. That's not the only way to be successful. And sometimes there's too much of a cloning thing, right? Well, if they're not exactly the kind of leader that I was, then they're not gonna be qualified or capable. But businesses evolve, and the things that they need might be, might be very different. Um, and sometimes sort of recognizing, instead of saying, yeah, I know you're a different kind of leader than I am, or your relationship to the business is different, it doesn't mean it's worse. And in fact, the things that you bring to the table might be exactly what this company needs for the next 30 years. They're different. And it's, it's hard to have that conversation. Um, but I think in, it's, it's healthier when you have it that way, on both directions, right? If you're the next generation coming in, and you don't want to say, the way that you've been doing this the last 30 years is really bad, right? That doesn't tend to go over that well. It's better to say, what you did was exactly what we needed to get us here but may be different than what we need to get us to there, right? And the more that you can start to have that kind of a conversation in both directions, it just makes it easier for there to be the inevitable differences across generation and celebrating and embracing those rather than seeing them as some defect in, in each other's character. All right. So I just shout it out. You can start, I'll make my way. So it was touched on yesterday, uh, uh, and uh, the, the piece of innovation oftentimes shows up in next generations, but a lot of organizations are very tradition bound, so are there ways to kind of, you know, uh, prime that pump? Yeah. Well, and, and I think the reality is, is it's, a, it's a both, uh, it's an and, not an or. Right? I mean, you want to be able to, for organizations to be successful over time, you both need to understand what has made you successful and different and what is the, the core attributes of that culture. Um, and you have to be willing to challenge some of those attributes and to innovate and to take on new practices. One of the things, one of the metaphors that I found helpful in, especially I, you know, taught in, teaching in business school, I, I work with a lot of next generations who are, you know, been through this two intensive years of learning and, and their temptation is to come back and just tell them all the reasons things are doing wrong. Um, and one of the things I tell them is there's this notion of grafting. Like when you want something to, when you're adding on to something else, you want to make sure that the host doesn't reject it, right? And the way that you do that is you try to make sure that there's some, some alignment or you're building on as opposed to saying we're just going to replace it. And so one of the things I would, it's all, sometimes just about the language and saying, you know, our company has always been very customer driven, right? But our customers are changing. They're, they're now online, they're not, fewer of them are coming into our store, more of them are shopping online. So we're not changing our value. Our, our, our value is always about doing everything possible to make our customers satisfied. Um, how we do that you know, is needing to change, just like it's changed in the past. And that kind of a conversation I found is much more constructive, if you can say, we are actually, let, we are building ourselves or, 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 or standing on the same values that have always been there, but as conditions changed, we've always changed and we will continue to do that. I think the same kind of, uh, you know, conversation, you know, can happen across a whole bunch of different, a whole bunch of different topics. And I've just found that that conversation tends to be, tends to be um, better received than the, let me give you a list of 10 things you, you're doing wrong. Murph, go ahead. Yeah, um, okay. Thanks. So um, everybody's heard about the proliferation of funding uh, new companies. So the growth in liquidity, you know, Series A, Pre-Seed, all that. Younger entrepreneurs typically. And uh, I see in the consulting business more family businesses. 
Is there any who tend to fund by net income, and as the gentleman was saying, maybe not take as much salary as they're used to, so throw and control. Is there any data to suggest what has a better outcome? Uh, I know there's lots of variables like execution and plan and industry and compound, you know, there's, there's a lot of variables we've got to hold constant. I was just curious if there's any. The short answer is not that I've seen, and in part because what we're really talking about are mostly private companies and almost all the data that you see about most topics are public companies. That's partly why business schools focus on them is because there's actually data available on them. Um, even when the, most of the data that, that you've seen on family businesses is actually comparing publicly traded family controlled businesses compared to publicly traded non-family controlled businesses. Um, so it's actually just a really hard uh, question to answer empirically. Um, I could just say, you know, I've, uh, my belief is that, you know, a lot of this has to come down to what you're trying to accomplish. And that's why uh, the, the Bo Burlingham's book on small giants is, is worth checking out because it's just this whole, you know, you know, in most places, and I think America in particular, growth is the obsession, right? And we, we sort of think if you're not growing, you're not succeeding. And the reality is there's lots of successful ways to build a business. And not all of them are about maximizing um, you know, maximizing the, the growth of it. And uh, so I think it would be hard because we'd have to assume that everyone was trying to do the same thing. And in reality, people's motivations is just within this room are, are varied. And so we'd have to judge success according to their motivations. So I, I think it's a fantastic question to ask. Um, it's a really hard one to answer. And I think I guess where I would ultimately get to is strategy is ultimately about alignment between your objectives and your actions your ends and your means. And so how do you know if you're successful unless you first answer the questions that we've been trying to, to talk about today is what does success mean? And one of the beauties of being an owner of a, of a family business and especially as a, as a private company is that you get to answer that question for yourself, right? And so I think encouraging you as a foundation to say what matters to us, how do we know if we're on track or off track are the things that we're doing getting us closer to accomplishing our goals or not? And if you don't start, start with the goals, I don't know how you're going to ever know if you're, gonna, if you're getting there or getting closer. So maybe that's a good place to end. Uh, brings us back to the beginning of the conversation. I do hope, uh, sincerely hope, that these conversations continue. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to network and meet with other folks who, who are in similar situations. Continue on those conversations. Build your network. It's one of the most valuable things about coming to events like this. Um, I'm also delighted if you want to continue this conversation, please feel Please feel free to reach out. And I'm just grateful for the, the First Bank folks for putting together uh, this kind of uh, amazing venue uh, to have dialogues like this one. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.